<laughs> Welcome everybody for uh, today's BPPB virtual seminar. It's a true pleasure to have two uh, riotous speakers, Mark Gershaw from NYU and Buzz Baum from Cambridge in England, um, who is an LMB in Cambridge in England. Um, Mark Gershaw is currently an associate professor of physics at NYU. And without further ado, Mark, please tell us about what do we think about when we think about maggots, technically not maggots, thinking? Oh, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, so um, yeah, uh, probably a lot of you have been teaching on Zoom uh, this semester and you know it is terrible. Um, and so this is probably going to be uh, terrible and I apologize for that, um, but we'll give it a shot. Um, and I guess uh, we're gonna shout out questions in the chat and I will get to them at the end is the way we're gonna do this. So I don't even see your confused faces right now. Um, so again, I'm sorry. Um, but so um, what I wanna tell you about, I wanna tell you um, briefly the people who did this stuff. Um, I'm gonna tell you about uh, fruit fly larva and just one decision that it makes. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna try and squeeze in two kind of very short little posters. Um, for a microscopy technique uh, we've developed that allows us to image activity uh, in behaving animals. Um, and an assay we developed to study how uh, learning changes the decision. And this is all, especially the second assay, uh, new and unpublished. Um, so we'll see how that works on a recorded talk. Um, okay, so the first part of the talk on the tracking microscope um, is the work of Myrna Mihovilovich Skinata. Um, uh, uh, with uh, some graduate students, Deutscho, Karagiozov, Paul McNulty, Akihiro Yamaguchi, and Ray Ru. Um, and Myrna uh, should be giving you a, a, a talk as a faculty member uh, now, but COVID inter intervened. Um, but so I would really urge you, if you enjoy the first part of this talk, to get in touch with Myrna and ask her for the full story. Um, and the second part of the talk is the work of Amanda Lazar, who is a, a senior graduate student in my lab and is really uh, with uh, undergraduate Javanta here, who's now at Stanford. Um, develop this assay from scratch and it's, it's really cool. Um, okay, so um, we really, we, my lab studies uh, um, the fruit fly larva. Um, and so it's sort of in between two model organisms that people, lots of people know, which is uh, C. elegans, which is a small transparent animal with simple behaviors, uh, EM wiring diagram, and uh, not too many neurons. Um, and the adult fly, which has the advantage of having a, a representative insect brain, some really nice genetic tools um, and more neurons than there are labs to study them. Uh, and then, uh, so we're, we're taking the cross of those two that all of the things in these columns here are all true for the fruit fly larva. So that's why we like to work with it. Um, so here's a larva crawling on across a dish. Um, I think this one was probably like 15 years old and trying to get away for some light, but maybe some odor, I don't know. Um, but what you see is it moves in a series of runs um, punctuated by reorienting turns. Um, and this is a familiar biased random walk strategy. Um, and what the larva wants to do is if it's headed in the right direction, um, it's going to do longer runs. And uh, if it's headed in the wrong direction, it's going to do shorter runs. And what that does is on average, it moves it uh, towards the thing it's looking for. Um, so um, that this is towards a banana, away from a banana, if you have more runs towards the banana, longer runs towards the banana, um, on average, you'll make it towards the banana. Um, and you know, how does it know it's headed the right way? Well, when it's crawling away from the banana, it's gonna experience a decrease in odor. Um, and when it's crawling towards the banana, it's gonna experience an increase in odor. Um, and so we should be able to evoke this turning behavior um, by providing uh, just temporal gradient. So if we put it in a flow chamber and we ramp up the odor concentration five minutes and ramp it down for five minutes, for five minutes it thinks it's headed the right way and for five minutes it thinks it's headed the wrong way. Um, Sri, you guys can see my pointer, right? Yes. Okay, great. Otherwise this is, does really. Um, and so when it's headed the right way, it turns less often. And when it heads the wrong way, it turns more often. Um, and carbon dioxide is aversive. So when you ramp up the concentration of carbon dioxide, they turn more often. And when you ramp down uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide, they turn less often. Um, and the same thing with the light intensity. So light is aversive. So when you ramp it down, they turn less. And, you know, so th this is every, every sensory modality we've studied, uh, larva do this behavior. And it's always a change in the value, not the value itself that determines the turn rate. Okay. 
So this is a little computation we study. Um, if life is getting worse, uh, turn. If life is getting better, keep crawling. Um, it takes input from sensory systems and output is through the motor neurons, right? So already there's interesting things where there are multiple sensory systems, but only one output pathway. So you can study then how do you uh, integrate and prioritize conflicting information. Um, and so one of the things you can ask is what is mathematical performance computation for single multiple senses? I was gonna put in a plug that we've got a couple of papers, eLife, um, that describe this. And so, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube and feel like stopping or if this, you know, uh, go, go look at uh, eLife, our eLife papers. Um, uh, but now the next thing we wanna ask is once we figure out the computation, we wanna know what neurons carry out the computation and how, and then the new thing we're asked is how does the circuit change its function uh, to make better decisions based on uh, information that's gotten in the past. Um, okay, so this is the tracking microscope work and, and um, the lead authors on this are Murna and Deutsch. Um, okay, so this is a squished larva. Um, we're looking at the motor neurons in the VNC. Um, and so this, these neurons have been made to express a genetically engineered jellyfish protein that uh, reports calcium. Um, that we use a yeast transcription factor to put this into the neurons. Um, we're using two photon excitation microscopy, which means that we have incredibly short bursts bursts of very intense light um, to excite the indicator. And then we read out the ind photons individually um, using uh, PMTs, and then we sort them using FPGA. Um, and this is all just the most routine thing in the world um, now. And so it's just like an example of how science has progressed to make what should be insanely hard, actually just routine and boring um, and fundamentally unpublishable. Um, but this is an immobilized animal. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to do the same thing. We'd like to know how these motor neurons are working in an animal that is crawling. Uh, and now we run into a, a problem with the larva. So this is a video from Ellie Hexer's lab in Chicago. Um, and it's the brain of the larva is labeled fluorescently. Um, and you can kind of see the cuticle here. And these are uh, motor neurons, right? And so this larva is crawling forward. And you're looking from the side. And I want you to watch what the brain and the cuticle do as the larva crawls forward. So here it goes. And the brain jerks back and up. The cuticle compresses. It changes the transparency. Um, you know, the brain is compressing. So this is, this is sort of a recipe for every uh, motion artifact there is in microscopy all at once in, in an animal. And so a lot of the things that you might do in worms, which crawl on their sides and have internal body pressure that prevents them from deforming, uh, just don't work in fruit fly larva. Um, so um, what we started out doing is saying, well, we can't do any neurons, so let's try and just do one. And if you just want one neuron, you don't actually need a picture of that neuron. You just need to be able to keep your beam inside of, of the neuron. So what we do is, this is all the information we have. We go around in a circle and we sample. Um, and so you can go in the circle very quickly. And based on the intensity on the points in the circle, you can figure out where the center is. And then you can feed back. And so we built this kind of uh, big microscope that does this. It has mirrors that we can skin, spin pretty fast. To get Z feedback, we go up and down with this resonant ultrasonic lens that moves the focus at 70 kilohertz. Um, and then we label the neuron with a um, green indicator that's a calcium indicator and a red stable protein. Um, and we count the red and green photons separately. We feed all of that into uh, FPGA, which takes every photon, knows the position of the beam, uh, does a Kalman filter, and then can track the position and the uh, intensity uh, in time. And then we feed back to always keep the neuron centered. Um, and then as the neuron moves out of the center of the objective lens, we feed back with the stage. So this is kind of what that looks like. So here is a larva, you're looking up at it. Behind it is microscope objective. This white spot is uh, an imaging artifact from the uh, laser beam uh, shined out the camera. Um, and so we can annotate that image then with um, with uh, the results of recording. So we have a red rate, a green rate, and a ratio which reports the activity. And this is a recording from a single motor neuron in this animal crawling. Um, we have some dots that matter. So here is this. Um, and you can see that every time you get this peristaltic wave, you get a burst of activity right here. Um, and if you're worried this is a motion artifact, what we did is we labeled uh, the same neuron with a GFP uh, and now 
you know, the ratio is completely stable. Um, and this isn't just the two minutes it worked, it's the 15 minutes that it worked um, over and over again. Um, when you have the indicator, uh, you can control for many millimeters and see the activity associated with every wave. Um, and when you don't have the indicator, uh, there's nothing happening. Um, okay, so then we looked at these um, interneurons in the larva's VNC. Uh, they're called A27H. And in a dissected prep, um, uh, there's indication that these neurons should be active when the larva is crawling forward, but not when it's crawling backwards. And so here's a larva crawling backwards. We're recording for A27H. You can see that the ratio is, the, there's noise in the um, intensities, but the ratio cancels that. And then as the larva starts to crawl forward, uh, you get this activity. Um, and so then if, this is all in cell reports. Um, and uh, there's some other neat stuff and some more videos if you're interested. Um, and again, it's not just the two minutes that it worked, but you see this over the entire course. So when it's crawling backwards, it's silent. When it's crawling forward, it's active. Um, OK, but now, of course, we'd like to do many neurons. All right, uh, and we're going to take advantage of the fact that this tracker really is very, very good and tracks the position of a neuron to better than a micron and faster than a millisecond. And so what we can do is we can use that as a reference to do imaging around it. So we got another microscope that has two separate scan heads that we combine. And on one of them, we feed a long wavelength beam that only sights red. And on another one, we feed a short wavelength beam that only sights green. So we're tracking a single neuron that's labeled in red and then imaging the volume around that neuron. Okay. And so um, here is a recording for these A27H neurons. Um, this is the IR camera. Uh, it's a 5 micron scale bar. There's the tail bar, there's its head. Uh, you can see the area that's scanning, and then we can zoom in, you can see the uh, fluorescence. Uh, and then this is the path in space that's traveling. So this is just kind of show you that it works. Um, here's the crawling. And you can see that there are these waves of activity. I hope you can see that uh, going from uh, posterior to anterior as the is crawling. Um, well, I'll point out, as you can see, if you look here or you watch here, you can really see how the um, window is moving. But if you watch this video, it's very hard to actually detect that movement. So the, the cancellation is really good. Um, so here it is kind of slowed down. So you can see the, um, you know, millimeter per second motion over here and over here, but it's very stable. Okay. Um, and again, when it's going backwards, this uh, neuron is pretty silent, or all the neurons are pretty silent. Um, Benny, its body. And now it's gonna start crawling forward again. And you can see this wave of activity. And I apologize, I think there's a better version of this movie that should have been included. Uh, that's my, my bad, but you can still see the waves. Um, and so one thing that no one knew before this is that when it bends its body, uh, these A27H neurons are silent. So now we know they're only active during forward motion, right? You can see the body bend and then um, the activity takes over as it crawls. Um, here's another bend. All right, so it's silent during the bend and then it's across forward. All right, so this is all great, um, but we run into a problem, which is that the, the basically larvae are gross. And so when they crawl, they squish their brains. So here's an extreme example of larva hunching, and you can see the uh, de deformation of the brain. Um, and so that makes it really hard um, to get kind of the real quantitative uh, delta F over F measures you would like because the compression really changes the amount of fluorescence you get from a volume. Um, and uh, we need some kind of correction for that. All right, so what we need is we need to go back to two color imaging. Uh, we need to have a red image and a green image. So right now we have a red tracking beam at 1070 and a green imaging beam at 920. Um, and we know which beam is which because when we excite red, we collect the photons of the red PMT and when we excite green, we excite the photons of the green PMT, we collect the green filter PMT. All right, um, so we'd like to just add red excitation to this beam as well and get them both. But the problem is now you need to one PMT differentiate between uh, two photon sources. All right, um, and so this is a problem that's actually been solved. Um, there's 14 nanoseconds in between each of these pulses. And if you shift the beam over by seven nanoseconds, uh, that's enough time for the fluorescence to decay from one to the other. 
Um, and so this is called temporal multiplexing. And if you can detect uh, when the photon came synced up with the laser beam, um, then you can sort them out. And uh, so working with Andy Haas, um, a physics professor who normally does uh, particle accelerator stuff, um, we came up kind of with a, a neat trick for doing this. I think that's the one thing I'm not going to talk about on YouTube. Um, but uh, you know, if you're interested, I can tell you later. Um, and, uh, and so it works. So I apologize that these have the same um, color scheme. But on the one on the left is a volume of the green image, of the green reporter. And then here is a volume measured in red, while we're still tracking a neuron in red in the center. Uh, and so I clicked these. You should see these synchronized. Um, and so there's a parasaltic wave that goes forward in the behavior. Image. So this is the same image on both sides. And this is the, the green fluorescence. The, uh, this is the Z projection, uh, projecting out the X and projecting out the uh, Y. Um, and so it's just sums. And so you can kind of see the Z motion um, and you can see the activity here. And then you can see our stable reference channel here. Um, I'll just point out a couple of features. Um, so you're here doing two forward strides. What you can see is you'll see a wave moving forward along the body, and the corresponding neurons are lighting up in what I'm going to call a ladder uh, inside the VNC composed of uh, neurites. So there's that ladder. And if you look, it's the ladder syncs up with the um, compression of the body, right? And what's important is that's not actually syncing up with when the, the wave passes through the imaging region, right? So it's not a motion artifact. Um, and if you look at the red channel, you know you can see the deformation, and you can see change intensity, but you don't see that ladder, um, uh, that wave. Um, and then again, this is so this is A27H. We know it's supposed to be silent when it's going backwards. And again, uh, you see that you don't, you know, you see pretty quiet in the VNC as it's going backwards. And when you look at the red channel, um, again, you see uh, just kind of a stable indicator. So this works. We have to solve some image registration problems, um, but then we should be able to get some nice ratiometric corrected images. And, and Ray Wu uh, in my lab has been been working on that and is making some nice progress. Um, okay, so um, we have a two-photon tracking microscope that we can record from motor neurons, inner neurons, in behavior animals uh, without motion artifacts. Uh, we now have volumetric two-color imaging and freely crawling larva. Um, to our knowledge, uh, and please put it in the chat or let me know if someone else has done this. We don't think anyone's ever done a two-photon recording of activity without attaching the brain to the microscope somehow, either implanting it or head fixing or something. Um, and again, I urge you, this went very fast. If you want to know more, please invite Myrna to tell you about it, uh, because this is an amazing story and uh, there are so many beautiful movies. Um, so hopefully I have enough time to tell you um, about a new learning asset my lab has made. So you have five uh, minutes. What? You have five minutes. I have eight minutes. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. Five plus three. Yeah, you have eight. Yeah. Sorry. My bad. I reserve the remainder of my time, Your Honor. Um, so larva can learn. Um, and this is not our discovery. This is uh, decades of work um, uh, to develop a paradigm where uh, you place larva on a Petri dish um, with an odor, and you give them a reward like sugar. Um, and then you take a second group of larva and you put them on a petri dish with, uh, with that odor and no sugar, but then you switch them to a dish that has a different odor and sugar. So in this case, odor A is associated with sugar. In this case, odor B is associated with sugar. Um, and then you put both groups of larva on a plate and you test whether they like odor A or odor B, and you can quantify how much they have learned by the difference um, between uh, the two odors, the, the preference between the odors depending on the training. And um, this assay has a lot of variations. It's very beautiful. It has a lot of advantages. Um, you can measure short-term repetitive and reverse memory formation. Um, they've demonstrated that instead of this presenting a real reward, you can just activate um, reward neurons, including just one pair of reward neurons, and generate um, this preference. Um, and you can even just do it once, and larva will learn. So this is you know, a really uh, wonderful assay, um, and it's allowed a lot of great discoveries. Um, but it also has some problems. Um, one is it requires a, a large number of larvae and extensive manual handling. So to do this experiment, you have to pick the larvae up, move them over, move them back, move them over, move them back, right? And typically there's like 30 larvae on a plate um, and 20 to 30 experiments done uh, for each group. So you're talking a thousand larvae 
um, that you have to move around to do this experiment. Um, you don't have a lot of control over how the uh, odor and the reward are presented together because uh, you're relying on diffusion and manual handling to, to move things around. Um, and then uh, a real limit is what you'll see is this is represents like a 60-40 split. So in each case, you know, a substantial minority larvae are going in the, I'll say, wrong direction. And so there's no way to tell whether an individual larva has learned or changed its preference, right? Uh, there's just a lot of stochasticity in how behaviors are expressed. Um, and so if you wanted to then get into like, what's synaptically different about this larva, or what's different about its nervous system, you can't actually know if it's one that's learned. Um, and, uh, and this asks, so far no one's shown a way to uh, form long-term memory in, in larva. Okay, so um, Amanda Laser has developed um, this new assay that allows you to measure a learning individual larva. So she made a Y maze and you give it a larva choice between air and carbon dioxide. And then as the larva exits, you change the flow direction. So it's all controlled by Raspberry Pi and computerized valves. Um, and the larva, you know, crawls around. They love to follow circles. So eventually, if you give it a second, um, it comes back. And now the computer picks a new set of choices. So now carbon dioxide is in this channel, air is in this channel, and the larva makes another pick. And if you let the larva do this a whole bunch of times, what you'll find is if you pick a concentration right, they'll choose CO2 about 25% of the time because they don't like it. Whereas if they don't have the CO2 receptor, you get a 50-50 split, All right? And now um, what we can do, what she can do is in the same device, she can test them. Then she can train them by activating uh, one pair of reward neurons. And again, this is an R discovery that you can train in this way. This is uh, published work. Um, there's, so there's one pair of neurons called Dan I1 that if you activate them, um, you can generate um, a, uh, an appetitive memory. So for 15 seconds, the CO2 comes on and uh, you reward the larva and then for 15 seconds it comes off and you can do that uh, N times. And then you test them again, you see how the preference has changed. So when you do that, what you find is that the larvae lose their aversion. Uh, we haven't been able to get them statistically about 50%, but they go from 25% you know, of the time choosing CO2 before they're trained, and these are the same larva, to 50% after they're trained. Uh, you only see that if you have, if you do the training, right? So this is the same line, but, but uh, not rewarded. Uh, if you just have the parent strains, it doesn't learn even after you do the training. And if you pair the reward with not CO2, you also don't get any uh, increase. So this is kind of showing that it works. Um, and again, these are individual larvae. So each larva has, uh, well, I didn't label this axis. This is a preference before and a preference after. Um, and so you can see there's a correlation, especially in the innate group between before and after. So we can ask for each larva, how much did your preference change uh, following training? So if there's no training, uh, the average change is basically zero. And if there is training, then you get like uh, 30%. Okay. So that's two points on a dose response curve, zero, it's 20 cycles of training. And then what Amanda did is she repeated this for one cycle of training, two cycles of training, three, four, five, and, and 10. Um, and you can see this nice curve being traced out that the uh, learning, the, the amount of preference change changes with dose. Um, and then again, we have individual larva. So now what we can ask is we can ask, how did you get from zero to 20? So there's Two populations, there's, there's starting, they all cluster around zero change, and at the end, they all cluster around 30% change. But was it something where as they trained, there's just one group of larva that all progressively become more attractive to CO2? Or are there a set of larvae that are um, untrained and trained, and as you increase the training, you move them from one group to the other, right? So this is whether learning is gradual or all at once, okay? And what you find is, in fact, learning is all at once. Uh, you can see really kind of clear in this two training cycle. It's just two distinct peaks. Um, uh, Mark? Yes. Clarification question, I think, yes. uh, reg uh, with respect to a slide from a couple of slides ago. Yes. From um, Xiang Ting Li, a bit confused about the green brackets bright part and red brackets purple part in the slide. Could you explain? The exact part for the green and M cherry. Oh, that's, can I, can I do that at the end? Cause I have to go back so many slides. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can, okay. So, sorry. So 
Um, but you can't distinguish whether it's all at once or gradual from just looking at the means. Like both of these will explain this quite well. Um, but um, so now that we know that they're learning uh, in jumps, we can ask how many larvae at each time point haven't learned yet. Um, and so this is a log linear plot of verse training cycles, the number of larvae that are in the untrained group. Um, and that's a log scale in a straight line. So it looks like exponential decay. Um, and so what we can actually do is now fit a model. This is fitting the number of untrained larvae individually for each of these. But instead, let's just fit to a model where there is the number changes by a certain fraction um, of the remaining untrained larvae learn each cycle. Uh, and that fraction fits to 32.4%. And this turns out to fit just as well with far fewer parameters as a model where you fit them all. So it really looks like larvae are learning. Uh, each time you do this, each time you prevent the reward, some fraction of the ones that haven't learned, um, learn and jump to the next group. Um, and so ironically, learning is a memoryless process. Um, and I show you all of the all of the all of these groups together on one histogram. Um, what you see is really that there are, in fact, just two distinct peaks, um, and the shifting mean model will give you kind of some more. Um, okay, so then the next thing Amanda did is she said, "Well, can they um, retain these memories overnight?" And so she trained, test, trained, test, then put them on food overnight and came back and tested them again the next day. Uh, and what she found is. Yes, they retain the memory just fine the next day, which is exciting because people haven't shown that larvae can uh, retain a memory over a day uh, so far. Um, and again, if you don't train them or you train them backwards, they don't suddenly learn the next day. Um, and then she said, well, what about two cycles? And that was really interesting because they learn right away uh, just fine with two train cycles, but the next day they've lost it. Um, and we were showing this to Albert Cardone and he said, well, how do you know the problem isn't that during this testing phase, they're not being rewarded and you've, you've caused an extinction of the memory. And I said, well, let's just try it. Let's just not test them immediately um, after training, just test them the next day. And in fact, uh, you see that then they retain the memory. Um, and so then the last thing I'll show you is that Amanda studied um, extinction. Um, so we have, um, we, she trained them n times and then presented always the same number of CO2 air reward cycles, 15, 15, without reward. And then as a control, we did a habituation where we presented the same amount of uh, CO2 before training. Uh, and what you see is that um, after, if you, if, you, if you immediately pair, give them a CO2 presentation that's not paired with reward, uh, you can extinct, you, you, can, you can reduce the change in preference significantly. Um, and that reduction happens in a dose dependent way. Um, and again, there's still two populations if you get all these larvae together. Um, so when you untrain them, they go back to the untrained state instead of some intermediate one. And so then we can ask what fraction of larvae learned um, as a function of the repetitions. Um, and so this is training only, this is habituation first, and it makes sense that those are the same because in both these cases, they're already being exposed to CO2 for an hour for testing beforehand. Um, but then you can see there's a big drop in the number of larvae that have learned for a small amount of dose. Uh, so um, Amanda wants to go back then and see if when you test them the next day, if um, you can, if once the memory has kind of consolidated, it's more resistant to extinction. Um, okay, so um, we have Ymaze assay that repeatedly tests an individual's odor preference. Um, Within this training protocol, learning is all or nothing, and it just adds the initial preference. Um, it forms memories that persist overnight. And there's one kind of I dotting T crossing thing we have to do before I can tell you that it's long-term memory instead of just a memory that persists overnight. Um, and uh, we have this extinction that can erase recently formed memories, and there's a strong dose dependence on that. So um, with that, um, I'll just remind you, uh, again, Myrna is amazing. and if you have the opportunity, you should invite her to give you a Zoom talk. Um, and Amanda has done really fantastic work on this too. All right, so there's now questions in the chat and Sri is gonna moderate those. Yes, um, since you went a little bit over time, um, we will take just a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, there, is, there was a technical question that since, you know, since we started on that, why don't you go ahead and tell us? 
So this is one note on this slide, what's going on? Yes, I yes. would get, and the additional question which I didn't read was, how do you determine the Z position? Right, so in what we have, so, so that's, so I glossed over the interest of doing this fast. Invite Myrna, Myrna will tell you, but we have what's called a tag lens. It's a cylinder of oil that's, uh, you're setting up a resonant wave in it. And so it forms a grin, a grin lens whose focus oscillates um, at 70 kilohertz or 200 kilohertz, whatever you tune it to. Um, and that's, uh, we put that in the same uh, plane as the objective. So that moves the focus up and down. So then we can, based on the photon arrival time, tell where the Z came from. Uh, and so that's how this image is being formed, is based on the phase of the tag lens at the time we detect the photon. Um, and then we also use that for tracking. The phase of the tag lens tells us where to go. So this is an image um, being formed by scanning um, a 920 nanometer laser to excite GCAMP uh, 7S in these neurons as the larva crawls. Um, and so this should be changing intensity depending on uh, the activity. And so you can kind of see, it's very clear that these neurites aren't active at all, or you know, aren't visible at all. And then as the animal crawls forward, you get this wave of activity probably from anterior to posterior. Okay. Then this is a temporally multiplex red beam. So this is uh, being scanned in the same patterns. It's scanned to the same spots as the green, as the, the 920, but it's 1070. Um, it is exciting M cherry, which is a red fluorescent protein that doesn't depend on calcium. Its fluorescence doesn't depend on calcium. Um, and so this is sort of a stable image. Everything you're seeing in terms of changes is because the animal is moving and we have to compensate for that motion. The cuticle deforms and, and blocks some of the beam, scatters things, right? The brain deforms, the Z height also changes. And so all of that together is what you're seeing here. And our goal is now in software to combine these two images so we can get a ratiometric measurement of activity that's quantitative. But I'm just being able to say like clearly there's activity here and it's not motion because this is the control for the motion. Great. Did that answer the question? Uh, yes, I think. And a uh, person who asked it will have a chance to ask more questions in the informal discussions. In the interest of time, a super quick question. And there's mm -hmm. a variation on the question which we'll get to in informal discussions. In the CO2 experiment, can the larva be mm -hmm. trained to always take a left turn even in the absence of carbon dioxide? Yeah, so, so we, we, we did the test where we show that they don't have a bias to go left or right initially, like a, as a group. Um, and then the question is, can we do operant conditioning to make them go left? And that's yep. certainly, that, um, that is certainly an experiment that could be done with this apparatus. It, it definitely is capable of rewarding a decision. Uh, after the fact, um, we have not done that experiment, but it's a good one. Um, and we could, we could see if we could get it to do that. Yeah. Great. Uh, with that, I think we'll close these discussions, but there are, there are many questions in chat which we'll get to at the at, at 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, so thanks again, Mark. What a stimulating talk and how cool are those movies? Uh, 